thank you sir for the kind introduction and i would also like to thank esi for this opportunity uh good afternoon uh, all the participants i would be speaking on a interesting topic that is management of osteoporosis and children it's a very vast topic and definitely it's not covered is not you know possible to cover all the aspects of osteoporosis in children so i have decided to cover up only the two difficult and the advances in the osteoporosis so the agenda goes like this for today's talk vijay you are muted again yes sir so it's automatically happening sorry for that okay okay so and it's introduction and it's a uh, then i will discuss an important aspect of bmd assessment children children because how to adjust the bmd z score for the variables what we encounter in children and then i'll move on to glucocorticoid induced osteoporosis in children right so to start with the definition of osteoporosis so as all of you know we don't use the word osteopenia and osteoporosis unless there is some criteria are met in children unlike adults right so in adults we know that any t score especially for postmenopausal women and men more than 50 years we use t score but in children it has to be z score so we define the low bone mineral mass or bmd when the z score is less than or equal to minus 2 but isn't sufficient enough to guide any management or to define osteoporosis no and this should be associated with clinically significant fracture history which is defined as at least two or more long bone fractures in children who are younger than 10 years or three or more long bone fractures in children who are aged between 11 to 19 years but however there is an exception where i don't depend on the bmd but still i can make a diagnosis of osteoporosis in children so what is the exception so if a child has a vertebral compression fracture which is indicative of osteoporosis that means the fracture happens in the absence of local disease or high energy trauma irrespective of the bmd we are going to make a diagnosis of osteoporosis in children of course the causes of osteoporosis in children are basically divided into primary and secondary the primary causes include osteoporosis in a child who is otherwise healthy right he doesn't have any other systemic illness but he has a primary bone disorder whereas secondary osteoporosis is the opposite so like where there is an osteoporosis is occurring in a person who has a no primary problem in the skeletal system but there is a secondary affection of the bone due to some systemic disorder like rheumatoid arthritis there is a list of conditions if i keep enlisting the causes of primary osteoporosis Uh, there's no end but the what we need to understand is that the most common cause is actually osteogen imperfecta again among osteogen imperfecta the most commonly affected gene is alpha subunit of collagen 1 if you look at the secondary causes of osteoporosis they could be nutritional where there may be impairment of calcium as well as vitamin d or it could be hormonal with predominantly it could be hypogonadism or hyperthyroidism or hypercortisolism even hyperpara drugs such as glucocorticoids anti epileptic drugs and calcineurin inhibitors states of chronic inflammation like rheumatoid arthritis and inflammatory bowel disease hematological diseases especially malignancies like leukemias or when there is a neuromuscular disorders like dishley muscular dystrophy which reduce the mobility or post organ transplantation etc right so i'm insisting these causes basically because later i will move on to gio so like there will be so many children right so there will be so many children come with a concern of bone health to us are we supposed to do bmd in each and every child so then who are the children who in whom we should do bmd only those children who are at risk for poor bone health or at risk for osteoporosis but where if i do a bmd i am going to change my decision for the management only for these children we should specifically select and go ahead with bmd and then 
now decide how what how to manage this child what are the methods used for assessment of bone mass as in adults it's commonly dual energy x ray absorptiometry but we can also use computerized tomography like quantitative ct peripheral quantitative ct and hrp qct but these are less often used because of the greater advantages of dexa so what are the extra advantages of dexa there is much lesser radiation exposure when compared to qct there is a greater precision we can assess multiple sites using dexa with a minimal radiation exposure and it's more commonly available than qct and even the normative data is more available for dexa when compared to qct but however qct is a more accurate measure especially to measure the true volumetric bmd which is of great use in children especially when we are dealing with short children but however what we are going to commonly do is dexa even in short children and that's the you know more important thing is to how to adjust for bmd in a short child or any other parameters what are the preferred sites we use one is a lumbar spine that is l1 l2 l3 l4 as we do in adults but the second one is unique to pediatric age group that is total body less head uh, there are also other sites in fact like as the data is evolving as the more and more reference data is being available for the other sites for example the femoral neck the proximal femur distal 134 rm even the lateral distal femur how be you know recently more and more used in the assessment of pediatric uh, bone health but of course in india we are greatly limited by the lack of normative data uh, for all these additional parameters though we have some amount of data for lumbar spine bmd and proximal femur bmd so another important point i would like to mention here when we are dealing with so you know pediatric bmd assessment as we need to know that the short bones are going to have an aerial bmd which is lesser than the bigger bones right even though they have a same volumetric bmd okay that's what is depicted in this picture so if you have two different sized cubes of the equal volumetric bmd but you measure bmd by an aerial bmd technique that is dexa there will be a smaller value or smaller number which you can obtain with smaller cube when compared to a larger cube what it says aerial bmd is going to underestimate bmd in smaller bones whether it may be a short height or a narrow vertebra so to understand this concept how to adjust for this bmd z score in children who are short so let us i will go take you through some adjustment modalities right so for example we have a 14 year old child in fact she is a growth hormone deficiency girl who came to us at the age of 14 years for both growth hormone treatment as well as the bone health assessment when we looked at the uh, total body less head bmd for this girl it read as z score as minus 3 right as i told you earlier anything less than minus 2 is low bone mass for a child but she is minus 3 that means definitely she is having a low bone mass for her age similarly for even the lumbar spine the z score was minus 3.9 definitely much lower than the what is considered as normal then how do we adjust bmd in children for you know height one thing what we can simply do is adjustment for height age but just by adjusting for height age what you see here for example in fact this 14 year old girl her height age was 6 years 10 months instead of entering her age as 14 months in the system if i entered her age as 6 year 10 months it's falling in the norm but if i do this method it's a very crude method because it discounts the bone accrual which should have occurred over the last few years for example if i take the age as 6 years 10 months and the currently the age of the child is 14 years whatever the amount of accrual of bone that should have been occurred over this time i am discounting that secondly i may also discount the effect of puberty because by 14 year most of the children would have entered the puberty so this is not the optimal method to adjust for height age so what do we do then we have another method called as adjust net more height z score right how do we do that we calculate something called as an height age z adjusted bmd score for this we have to have the bmd age z score minus 
height age z score predicted bmd z score so what we are going to do here i will tell you in the next slide but let me know that like to predict the height for age z score we have some certain formulas but they are derived from the caucasian population i'm not taking it that i'm going i'm suggesting it to do in our indian population i'm just giving you it as a concept or be more interested like if indian pop you know indian data comes up in this regard which would be more accurate to interpret our bmd z scores what do we do here once we have a models we take that model formula here i'm taking an indian girl obviously she is a non black girl i and i'm looking at the whole body bmd so i'm going to choose this formula when i choose this formula and i stands for the data of this girl who is have who is around 14 years of age who has a height sds of minus 4.6 so and then i am calculating the height age z predicted bmd z score what is this so what i am going to derive from this data is that so i am going to derive a new zero st for a 14 year old girl who is very short so when i derive that this is corresponding to the minus 1.17 sd on the 14 year old girls who have a normal height so then whatever the bmd which i got on the normal measurement bm you know dexa then i am going to convert that or adjust that to her short stature so when i adjusted it for a short stature the height adjusted bmd z score for this girl is minus 1.83 instead of reading it as minus 3 it is reading as minus 1.83 after the adjustment so that's how it means that if we have if i compare my girl in this scenario with 100 girls who are otherwise healthy but short and who have like height as they are minus 4.6 for those girls this girl will still have a normal bmd that's what it says so once i adjust and i get a value better than minus 2 i'm happy that i'm not dealing with any kind of a low bone mass let's move on to the second one it's more important because it could be easily followed even in our setting that's called as bone mineral apparent density but it can be done only for lumbar spine and the femoral neck bmd so what we commonly measure is lumbar spine in children so i'm going to take up that again we need to use the data of bone mineral content and area of the l1 to l4 in the dexa then i am going to use a formula that is bmc divided by bone area to the power of 1.5 and when do this calculation i am going to get a you know apparent bmd so if you look at this chart i am going to get the data from l1 to l4 for bmc and area and then for area i am going to take to the power of 1.5 translate into the formula finally when i calculate the bone mineral apparent density it is 0.247 and once i have the bm ad then i have to put it on a reference chart if i'm using the caucasian reference if i put it on the chart for a non black female it's exactly sitting at 0 sds for 14 years old children that means the bm ad is absolutely normal even when you are looking at a caucasian data but for this we also have indian data in fact i should thank dr kardil kur is a, you know he has helped the pediatric endocrinologists in several aspects by providing normative data and one such his great contribution is also providing the bmad reference codes but there is a limitation for this because it's derived from a pencil beam equipment when which while we are commonly using a fan beam uh, instrument now for dexa measurement however till we have the more data coming up we can still use this data when i put the data on this chart the girl is measuring between 25 to 50th centile which is absolutely normal for her there are also some other simple methods to calculate bmad you can go to this calculator and just enter what type of equipment you use it's a holochika lunar enter the area and bmc of all the four Uh, lumbar vertebrae and get the data you can also calculate simultaneously for the femoral neck the third important approach is a molgaard's approach it because it's not only adjust for the height but it also adjust for the whole small bone and then checks whether the bones are osteoporotic or not so in fact fortunately the one which we are using was actually spontaneously automatically was giving this approach you know which is like inbuilt in our dexa machine so if you look at this molgaard's approach when we applied for the same child 
when you compared the height for age, obviously she was very short. So it's almost near zero centroid. Whereas when once I know this girl is short, then I want to know whether this, this is also a narrow bone. How do I do that? For that, I take area versus height. So if I take the area versus height, even that was almost near the zero centrile, again, indicating that the bone was not only you know, short, but also narrow. But now, since the bone is short or narrow, I cannot use, I cannot compare this girl's bones BMD with the reference population of that age of normal height. So then what do we do? We calculate the bone mineral content for area. But when I do that, you can see here, she's on the 60th percentile. That means when I adjust for Molgaard's approach, she's absolutely normal in terms of her BMD. Again, another approach is mechanostatic approach where the BMD is adjusted for the lean body mass. Again, here we see the height for age. Again, she's short and falling on zero centile. So again, we have to adjust for lean body mass. When we check her lean body mass for her height, again, it's too low. I mean, like even though she's short, so but her lean body mass even lower for despite adjusting for her height. So then I have to adjust the BMC for lean body mass. Again, when I adjust the BMC for lean body mass, she is falling on the 83rd percentile, which is absolutely okay for her lean body mass. So these are the some approaches which we can use to adjust in children when we have very short children. So with this, I will move on to another interesting case where we focus on the management. Here we have an eight years old girl. She is steroid dependent nephrotic syndrome for the last one year. She has received one to two mg per kg per day of prednisolone for at least nine months over the last one year. So now she presented with pain abdomen and fever. The pediatrician suspected spontaneous bacterial peritonitis and he asked for ultrasound along with an erect x-ray abdomen. Fortunately, during that erect x-ray, they also did a lateral x-ray, which gave us important finding from bone health point of view. Can you identify what is that finding? If you can see here, there is a nice compression or nice anterior wedging of a lumbar vertebra, which says that there is an incident vertebral fracture, which was detected at x-ray, which is in the, you know, intended for some other reason. So again, if you look at whether we can apply the vertebral fracture assessment in children or not, in fact, like maybe a few years ago, we did not have much data to use this Ganant semi-quantitative method, which we routinely use in adults. But now we have sufficient data, even the 2019 ISCD guidelines do suggest to use vertebral fracture assessment to look for you know, compression fractures in children. Thus, if you use the same method and also same ratios, whenever there is a height loss of around 20% or more, we qualify it to be a compression fracture. And even the gradations are also same, 26 to 40% is called as moderate and more than 40% is called as severe. Another interesting study published just in 2021 in JCEM. Uh, it has few important points and there's a reason why I took it specifically. Uh, it also gives a prevalence of vertebral fractures of 16.3%, which is similar to what was reported previously, which varies from almost around 10 to 30% prevalence of vertebral fractures in children who are treated with glucocorticoids. What this study observed is that most of the vertebral fractures occur within 24 months of glucocorticoid initiation. And there's also the predictors which the authors could observe. So who, who is going to get new onset vertebral fractures on follow? They were like, for example, a child who has been treated for rheumatoid arthritis, but the activity is uncontrolled. They are the ones who are more likely to develop. Or someone who gained more weight, like with those who come with an increase in the BMI Z score, they are the ones who are going to develop vertebral fractures in the future. Or if you have done a BMD after six months of initiation of glucocorticoids and there's a decrease in the BMD Z score at L1, L4, they are the ones who are more likely to develop vertebral fractures in the forthcoming years. Another unique point, what really brought out so well in the study is that once we stop glucocorticoids in these patients, there is a nice reshaping of vertebrae, it, which occurs in almost 84% of the children. So what it says, the osteoporosis, which is GIO induced, is reversible in growing children. There's something very new concept which we came up with the study. 
So as you can see here, when after two years of therapy, there was an anterior wedging and also anterior cortical buckling. But if, when the patient was followed up for four years, there is a nice reshaping of the vertebra, so which indicates that there is a recovery of osteoporosis, which was induced by glucocorticoids. But however, what we need to understand that there is a less scope for reshaping when the child is in the peripotal age. Right, so again, like moving on in the same direction, how do we manage a child who comes with a glucocorticoid induced uh, osteoporosis? So if you look at how, to, how if you look at how to assess them, first look at what is the cause you are giving steroids for. Whether it's for malignancy, it's an inflammatory disorder, or an aphrotic syndrome, or an organ transplantation, or a neuromuscular disease. Then look at how significant the glucocorticoid exposure was, whether it was aggressive but transient, or it's variable, or aggressive and long term. Then you assess the potential of a child to have recovery of osteoporosis. I'm going to take up in the next few slides. How do we assess the potential for recovery, right? If the potential as for recovery is significant, for example, leukemia we use for a very short time, the recovery would be more. And then probably you can wait and watch. Variable, you decide on the disease activity and other things. Whereas in patients where the recovery is likely absent, like for example, Duchenne muscular dystrophy, where we have to continue therapy for, you know, almost like for years together, and there's also, you know, there's no reversal of the pathological process. That means persistent immobility will be there. So obviously there will be an increased risk of progressive osteoporosis. So probably these are the group where we need to start them on best possible means. So going into the more details of the same concept, just to put some lights into your practical uh, you know, practice. Whenever we have a child who has received supraphysiological doses of glucocorticoid, whether it may be oral or intermittent intravenous, which is more than eight to 10 milligram per meter square per day hydrocortisone equivalent for more than three months, right? They are the ones whom we're going to look for complications of glucocorticoids that is including GIO. What do we do for them? Optimize the treatment for underlying disease, preferably with a steroid sparing agent and ensure adequate calcium and vitamin D intake. Encourage the mobility, ensure that the child does not become too obese or overweight and train them if they develop any back pain to come back immediately and report to you. If the child is also in the peripubertal period and as also there's a delayed puberty, address that simultaneously so that delayed puberty does not contribute much to the poor bone health. How do we monitor them? T tell these children who are on steroids to undergo lateral spine imaging at baseline as well as once in a year. Monitor the changes in the body mass index every three to six months. If someone is gaining more, in, you know, gaining an increase in BMI is someone who is at higher risk. Do a BMD at baseline again at 12 months. If at all, if the child is developing Cushingoid features or BMI Z scores are increasing, he's a candidate for early BMD monitoring. As I told earlier, they're the one who are going to go for more osteopenia. Again, if some child comes with a back pain, or if you have done a BMD at six months and the Z score is decreased by more than 0.5, that's an indication for repeating a lateral spine imaging earlier than a EO. So once we do all this monitoring, and there is early signs of vertebral fracture. How you identify it, as I told by Ganant's method. You can also look at the loss of end plate parallelism. You can look at the end plate interruption or anterior cortical buckling, which also indicate the possible compression fracture. But however, the lower parameters require expertise, should be read by some expert, typically a radiology expert, who can read them with accuracy because it's not easy to differentiate, for example, arterial cortical buckling, which could be a physiological change in children from a pathological buckling. Again, or this vertebral fracture evidence is there or a low trauma long bone fracture is there, then obviously we'll go for therapy, right? So at least we consider therapy. So if there is fact, these evidences are there, how do we go about? Further, we look, there is, we assess the potential for reversal of this osteoporosis. Whether there is any chances of spontaneous vertebral body reshaping without adding anti osteoporotic therapy or bisphosphonates. So, if you have a patient who has a transient risk factor, which is less than three months of steroids, 
and even if they are immobilized, the immobilization was less than two weeks. Or someone who had a rheumatological disorder, but they have a well-controlled disorder, and also the child is younger, uh, with a more residual growth potential left, and has a milder vertebral compression fracture. Nothing, no anti-arthropodic treatment is required. Just continue to monitor. But however, if we have a persistent risk factor, what we define it as more than three months steroids, reduced mobility, poorly controlled underlying disease. Uh, or a child who is having a less residual growth potential, or a child who has a more severe collapse where they may take a longer time or they may be symptomatic, it's better to treat with intravenous bisphosphonate therapy. Once we decide to treat them or you know, keep them under monitor without therapy, keep continuously monitoring them, whether especially when the child continues to be on steroids or at least as long as the child is on steroids, or even if you have stopped the steroids, but the risk factors for osteoporosis other than steroids are still on board. For example, reduced mobility as we see in DMD or poorly controlled underlying disease. How are you going to monitor? Again, the same thing, do an annual spine imaging and BMD, but do spine imaging earlier if there is a back pain or a faster reduction in BMD over six months. Again, once you do an imaging, if there's an evidence of early vertebral collapse or low trauma long bone fracture, then again, you start them on bisphosphonate. If not, follow them up till you meet the goal. That is BMD Z scores appropriate for height, normalization of bone accrual rates appropriate for age, bone age and gender. And there is a reshaping of vertebral bodies following the vertebral fractures. And there is absence of new low trauma. How do we follow up those who are being started on bisphosphonate, right? So you're going to consider bisphosphonate, someone who has a fracture, at least one fracture, Again, here we don't look for two fractures to qualify them for bisphosphonate because we have a great risk factor start sitting here. Even if there's one low trauma fracture, we're going to put them on therapy. So are we going to put them on everyone? No, only for those who have a less potential for recovery, there's the older children. We define older children as those girls age more than eight years and boys more than nine years. Or even in younger children, but they have like persistent risk factors defined as ongoing glucocorticoid exposure, reduced mobility, and poorly controlled underlying disease. Even in these patients, we have to start bisphosphonate. There's also clause. For example, we have a younger child, okay, but he's not having persistent risk factor, but he's already suffered a fracture which is severe and he's suffering from back pain, which alters his quality of life. Even in this scenario, we can start the bisphosphonate. Monitor, as I already told in the previous thing, the monitoring is same, so I'm not going to go for that. But once you reach these goals, the final goals of a normal BMD, then you are going to switch the bisphosphonate therapy to the maintenance doses. If not, continue bisphosphonate as the therapeutic doses as you started with. So what are the suggested therapeutic and maintenance doses for bisphosphonates in children? You can, therapeutic doses for zolendronate include 0.1 mg per kg per year, whereas maintenance is one fourth of it, right? That is around 25 microgram per kg per year. Whereas for pamidronate, it is 9 mg per kg per year is a therapeutic dose, whereas the maintenance dose is one third of it, that is 3 mg per kg per year. To summarize, DEXA is indicated in children only when the patient may benefit from interventions to decrease the fracture risk. DEXA is the recommended modality for assessment of BMD in children. Use either the lumbar spine or TBLH, which are the most preferred skeletal sites, though you can use other modalities if the, these sites are not possible. In short, children don't just make the diagnosis of osteopenia or osteoporosis by comparing to the age math population. You have to adjust for the height Z score so that we are not over diagnosing osteopenia in these short children. Glucocorticoid induced osteoporosis is the most common cause of uh, secondary osteoporosis. Vertebral compression fracture, especially common in the thoracic, typically in the T4 to T7, are the most common fragility fractures in children treated with glucocorticoids. Reshaping of vertebra is a unique phenomenon in growing children. Consider bisphosphonates in GIO only when less potential for reshaping is observed. Thank you so much.